Brian Piranha is a seasoned, seasoned speaker. So um, I, I'm sure he's going to have some great things in store for you today. Um, so, so yes. Um, oh, here, some more people come in. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. This is day three of Guggenheim Wellness Week brought to you by Body Works. So we've had a great start to the week and I'm just really excited um, for you all to be here for what we like to call it Body Works Wellness Wednesday. So um, for everyone's awareness, I am going to be recording today's <clears throat> workshop. So that's again in a second. Recording in progress. Great. I always find that voice so funny. Um, but anyway, all right, everyone. So thank you so much for being here. I'm Sarah, and I'm one of the event coordinators at Body Works for Your Health. Um, today's workshop, we always have our trusty Body Works CEO, Victor Egbuna, um, who's particularly excited about today's workshop. Um, so we're, we're just so happy to have you all here. Um, today's workshop will cover gut health. So we, we all know the common phrase that the gut is our second brain, uh, but you know, what does that really mean? And how do we take care of our gut? So today's webinar is going to cover, cover some of the basic tenets of gut health and how you can start the journey towards better digestion. And leading today's workshop is Brian Piranha. Brian Piranha graduated in 2005 with an exercise science and nutrition degree. And one reason he chose this profession is his love of working with people to help transform their bodies by blending both exercise and diet in an individualized approach. Yep. His career started out at a traditional gym as a personal trainer where he had the fortune of working with hundreds of everyday people who manage busy schedules, families, careers, to help them better understand how to balance exercise exercise, nutrition, and well-being. And after his time as a personal trainer and nutrition expert, he opened up two CrossFit gyms in which he worked with thousands of clients through five plus years. And since selling off his gyms, he's chosen to focus his coaching abilities on helping others understand nutrition, fitness, and overall health to better their lives. Yes. So without further ado, take it away, Brian. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone on here and looking forward to uh, really engaging with you today. I'm going to stop my video and start the sharing of the presentation. Now, as Sarah said, we do have the uh, chat box live and open, so please, please engage. There's a couple stopping points in our conversation. Uh, today that we will kind of pause to reflect on some of the things we said and shared and then be able to jump into it as we go. I have my chat box open and I know that Sarah will be monitoring it as well. So whenever you feel something needs to be presented, please ask a question or share or engage. Again, you'll just get a lot more out of it than just sitting on the sidelines. So I've been doing uh, webinars, informational webinars for you know, a, a good year or two now, and it's been with telehealth and everything been transitioning that way. It's definitely obviously a lot more acceptable to do so. And it's easy to present things like gut health or all sorts of other different things on nutrition, wellness, time management, fatigue, brain health. So I've done a lot of variety of topics. So I'm excited to bring you gut health and how to promote a healthy digestion system. So we're going to be going through this and, um, at first glance, like, does anyone have gut health issues? Uh, upset stomach, uh, plumbing's a little too fast, plumbing's a little too slow, um, there's indigestion or any of that stuff. You could acknowledge if you like in the comments and we can kind of dive in to see how some of what is presented today impacts that and then also how to, you know, create a better gut health system. So... Here's the content. So what we're going to be doing is, number one, going over why is it important, gut health important. Number two, when gut health goes wrong, and then how to improve it. Most importantly, and that's the most exciting part, you are in control of the food you put in your mouth. So consequently, one, whatever food choices you're making and portions of those foods and the combinations that go into the mouth, then we can impact gut health quite quite a big difference. I, I work with a number of 
the general clientele, I would say about like 70% is generally typically weight loss. As you can imagine, I actually hired a client today, Michelle, who's looking for weight gain, shockingly enough. She's an over busy realtor that doesn't eat a lot and absolutely absently minded Mrs. Meals and stuff. And, and then I have gut and digestion health where you know, I have some people that have yes, no, and absolutely not meal uh, trigger foods and such where the one lady I remember, she had, she would have hive breakouts and she was a principal of a school. So, you know, uh, not, not the most exciting thing to do to get, uh, to have a, a hive breakout because of some food that you ate and it triggered a response, a negative response in your body. But we were able to kind of figure out what food she could eat and what balance and all that stuff. And it worked out really, really well. And lastly, of course, always, always, always consult your doctor. And we'll go over some of the water, the fiber, uh, and, and definitely ways to keep track of that. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out the, the keep tracking thing, uh, like my fitness pal is a, a super easy way tool. It's just a tool, not a lifestyle, but a tool for you to be able to use and be able to track water, fiber and stuff. So there are ways to go about it to actually understand what it is you're eating. Uh, so let's jump in because I've got a lot to talk about and I will probably talk too long if I'm not careful. Why is gut health important? All right, so what is gut health? Well, uh, the important thing is to understand where the digestion tract starts, okay? So it starts with the very part of when food hits the mouth and the saliva starts to break it down and it starts to get rid of the, starts to uh, decompose the material that you're eating to be absorbed through the gut stomach and into the intestines and such. And so it kind of works through mouth, esophagus, the stomach, small, large intestine, the rectum, and out the back door it goes. And so <clears throat> other components of this are liver. It releases bile, which helps break down fat. The pancreas it releases digestive enzymes, in which help break down the food matter that goes into the body. And the gall, gallbladder stores the bile so that your body, it secretes it at the right amount and right time to break down the fat. So liver releases bile, gets stored in the gallbladder, gets released into the digestive tract, and the bile and the digestive enzymes are breaking food down throughout the whole process. <clears throat> now, we go back to this. This is what it looks like. I'm sure you can remember, um, you know, anatomy 101 stomach goes into the small intestines goes into the large intestines the colon and then it goes out through the the back door now what is in the stomach so the stomach does quite a lot okay now um with this obviously it digests foods it helps communicate the information about our hormone levels and general health to our brain that gut second brain of our body and so it, it truly is like that and it's a major part of the immune system right imagine all the um, bacteria that comes in food that you eat and all the the, the you know, breathing and stuff that can get into your body so your body does have a huge important uh, part of di digestion and dealing with the immunity in your body now, so close to 70% of our immune system is found in our gut where it's dealing with pathogens. Uh, our gut health and microbiome has so many different trillions of bacteria and different fungi and such that live in there. And those are what's doing all the work to keep you healthy, keep the digestion process moving forward. And it, it really helps influence everything in your body. So I do see the messages, Casey, so I will get to those. Um, and so what one with the, the gut is, why is it the second brain? Well, certainly you have a lot of nerve interaction with that, right? Digestion takes a lot of effort and your brain needs to communicate with the process to trigger certain systematic things to happen at certain times in the 
the process of digestion, but also the influence on what's in the gut influences into the brain and the body and the mind and can cause a lot of you stress or distress, things where, that lift you up with good energy or things that bog you down. Eating a lot of sugar certainly gives you that, that roller coaster like effect. So we go way up on the, the hill and we come crashing down. And that's and then usually it's not a good thing as it goes through digestion, having a lot of sugar and stuff. So um, the, the gut, the food, the things that you put in it definitely impact your stomach and, and how it is uh, in, in your body in general. Uh, so bacteria in your gut. There's a kind of a zoomed in of what some of the bacteria could look like there in that picture. We have trillions of them in the body, mostly in the large intestines. Uh, the bacterial cells outnumber your human cells 10 to 1. So if we, we, we get this, we're like 90% bacteria, and then we also are like 70% water, as long as you're staying hydrated, as the saying goes. Species, there is a lot of different species going in your body and in your gut. And the weight, if you were to weigh all this bacteria, it could range from two to six pounds, which is pretty tremendous. Uh, sometimes you see the scales going down, and so that is causing some uh, you know, gut health, good stuff or bad stuff. Now, so what, what is the microbiome? This is all those, that environment that's inside your gut, and it's the part that uh, is uh, improving your immune function. It's uh, getting rid of the growth of har harmful bacteria and microorganisms. If you have bad bacterial balance going in your stomach just by, through poor food choices, or say excessive amounts of any one substance. So we could think of course like alcohol, but even excessive amounts of you know, coffee or any other type of food product could be negative and throw your body out of whack and cause it to do a lot of extra work. Uh, fermentation of indigestible food, that's fiber. So we want fermentable foods going into the stomach to improve digestion. We do want fiber. We'll go over that as we go, breaking it down what it is. It helps produce nutrients. So vitamin K, B vitamins, short chain fatty acids, uh, fatty fat cells and stuff in your, your digestion is uh, important to give you nutrients. Like B vitamins are, you know, give you energy. That's a direct uh, result of having B vitamins in your body. So, uh, and it influences hormones and there's, there's a lot going on in that, that gut. <clears throat> what affects your gut? So this is where things start to go. Uh, it can impact your gut health. Uh, of course, so lifestyle, stress, anxiety, nutritional factors, whether you're eating good, healthy foods or not. Uh, certainly, we can all say that organic probably leads you to a better nutritional uh, micronutrient diversity, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to buy organic everything to get really good health and good gut microbiome. We do want to practice balanced meals. That's super important. So we're not just eating. Uh, unfortunately, a typical uh, American diet is heavy carbs, fats, sugar, and sodium with low protein, low fiber. And so it's often simple carbohydrates that are quick, easy, convenient because we're overly busy lifestyles. And that also just kind of reiterates everything on this list. A disease, infection, and, and, can, and medications can definitely help or, uh, or hurt, help or hurt your, your gut. And so medications uh, like uh, antibiotics, we'll go over in a second, uh, how they impact your gut health as well. So these are really big. You know, how many times have you felt anxious or stressed about something and your stomach doesn't quite feel well? There's that brain to gut connection and it, it just doesn't translate well for you. So these are factors that can affect your gut health. Now, when does gut health, when, when it goes wrong? All right, so we, we see the picture here, upset stomach. You know, how many 
how many times in a week do you have an upset stomach? I'd love to see it in the, the chat box. If, if you have specific gut health, um, I there's a gentleman I talked to last night. James is his name. And so James is experiencing a little, little too quick plumbing in a sense. And coming to seeing pictures of what he's eating and we kind of through conversation, I actually talked with my clients is that the gluten could be a trigger. We have gluten, uh, dairy and soy. Those are kind of the main triggers, uh, or main easily seen triggers that show up time and again. So if you're doing an elimination diet or something, those are going to be the first things that get pulled out to start to start the process of trying to figure out what is happening in that gut and and see if we can get some better balance so we figured out gluten was a big issue and then also we practice a lot more balance around getting more protein and vegetables in his diet more water and it started to uh firm things up slow things down in a situation so when gut health goes wrong <clears throat> here's some some impact to our society in general so I found these on the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestion and Kidney Disease. And so with this, what we have is prevalence of 60 to 70 million people are impacted by disease all the time. Uh, ambulatory care visits. So 48 million. This is back a little older data, but it's probably only gone up, especially with that of uh, COVID and all. Hospitalization is... 2.1 million from just digestion itself, mortality, almost 250,000 deaths, and costs of over $141 billion. That's a lot in there. And, and so what's happening with these dollars, it goes towards, obviously, care, medicine, uh, the services of those professionals, the transportation, if you need that in any in instance, uh, productivity lost. You know, if you have an upset stomach and you're not going to work, that's costing your employer and, and money and time. And it's just making things less productive all around. Now, here's some unhappy gut signs. So we go back to the, the alarming stomach pain. So signs that things are not going so well in the stomach, uh, of course, pain and excessive gas heartburn, bloating, fast or slow plumbing, a low energy fatigue reigns throughout or you you feel that consistently throughout the day. Uh, an unfortunate of things exiting out the entrance hole with vomiting, uh, blood in the soul. Certainly if you know any of these you'd want to go visit the doctor if it's pretty sustained uh, over time. Uh, the bathroom. I haven't go to the washroom quite a bit. And then uh, just not getting a lot of absorption happening uh, in your micronutrients in the colon and in the intestines. And then, of course, irritability, anxiety can be caused from poor digestion as well. All right. If anyone would want to comment on any of these that they might have, that's fine. I can't imagine people volunteering too much information. That was one of the things I was trying to think when I was talking about engagement. How do I keep things uh, not so personal and a little more uh, global level instead of so uh, individual? All right. Health effects of an altered gut microbiome. Uh, allergies and autoimmune conditions can alter your stomach. So, um, being uh, allergic to you know, the outdoors or um, having autoimmune conditions like like lupus can cause issues with your microbiome. And just think about the amount of uh, medications that need to be taken for those that can, again, alter your gut biome if you're constantly taking in this medication and it's maybe hoping on helping on a more global level uh, in a bigger picture of like getting rid of some symptoms and addressing some of the aches, pains, and, and illness, but it could be distorting your microbiome. Uh, in 
increased inflammation is a big one, uh, of course, in your gut, but systematically across the whole uh, body where we can get some gallbladder issues or some pancreas issues, pancreatitis, where uh, I ran into a gentleman that had chronic pancreatitis, was in the ER every other week dealing with excessive strain pain where you know they had to go get very strong pain meds to bring it down. And so uh, this person needs to be monitored by their doctor, needs to be a, have a very closely monitored um, nutritional approach so that they can improve and you know, decrease the inflammation and decrease the amount of pain and, and issues that they are uh, having. Now, uh, so aging, uh, as we get older, our microbiome can alter itself. Um, <clears throat> impaired function with the immunity and could be a potential for uh, infection if we're not good in the gut as well. So here's some of the squiggly lines that they kind of look like at first glance, a microbiome. And then it's, there's an ecosystem in your gut. So I'm going to jump to the last one. Think of like a desert versus a rainforest. Uh, different types of species of these interact differently. They can compete with each other for the same food sources or one, as it says, one species waste is another species dinner. So they can engage in a positive situation. Increasing and decreasing population of one species may affect the other. Just think of like the, the earth, uh, your, your food chain. Uh, there, uh, everything has a place in the world, all the way from your top predators, like the shark and stuff, all the way down to the dung beetle. Everyone has a role in what they are doing and why they are placed in this. And if we eradicate one, then it causes a strain on the ecosystem of another. So like in the desert, the uh, first thing I think of like is like snakes. Like we get rid of snakes and all of a sudden maybe the rodent population increases, which then can increase a lot of disease uh, coming from the rodent population. Or in the rainforest, um, you know, deforestation is causing a huge impact on the life uh, in the rainforest, the animals and, and, and all that uh, creatures that live there. And, and so then it, it creates a strain on the, you know, less rainforest creates a strain on the animal population and how it interacts with each other. <clears throat> so different ecosystems and different locations of the body are dependent upon the types of food sources there are, the pH level, acidic or too alkaline, uh, your temperature in that process. Our body does a pretty good job of 98.6 regulating us uh, right around there and that's important and then humidity of that uh, the moisture and content of it so uh, and each again each bacteria can live in certain situations over others so we have um, you're just thinking of an animal that lives in a variety of different conditions that are uh, different um, so, um, some alterations can have massive effects. So we talked about that pretty good. So antibiotics, the average child is prescribed 10 to 20 and times, uh, throughout their kind of youth getting to building into the, um, antibiotics for illness. So if you have a, uh, an infection, then an antibiotic can be used, and it works really well. Well, antibiotics can then destroy some of the gut microbiome. So tetracyclines and macrolides are two that can cause some issues in your gut. And it's really important to kind of go out of your way to have probiotic-rich type food and probiotic themselves the the supplement itself so antibiotics are definitely necessary to help you treat illness and infection but again alters the microbiome and i had one gentleman had 
some treatment in his stomach where they tried to eradicate some of the the stomach and did like some excessive cleansing and and used different uh, products and you know, protocols and it altered the gut biome pretty good to the point where the guy was allergic to chicken all of a sudden he had never in 30 years never had problems eating chicken and now it causes severe digestion reaction like you know uh, uh, indigestion and you know uh, acid reflux and stuff. So that's a problem because if you, you enjoy a certain food and all of a sudden you can't have it and it's healthy, like say chicken, then that that really alters the type of nutritional approach that you're using and the diet, the foods that you eat uh, can have. Uh, in having antibiotics and having your gut biome altered can in, you know increase your risk of disease because your body is not as on guard and uh, be able to immune suppress some of the situations that are going uh, and just can ultimately can lead to consistent continual infections and such so uh, things like yogurt sauerkraut can definitely be helpful those are fermentable foods and such uh, there was a question earlier about probiotic yogurts are they a gimmick um, the the biggest thing is you need to understand what for any supplement, what the minimum viable dose is. And once you realize what the minimum viable dose is, your, your Activia yogurt, as a, an example, may or may not, um, may or may not uh, help you in your situation uh, with what you're trying. So you might be having these probiotic-driven uh, products, but it might not be getting the impact that you need for your gut health. So we'll go over some like gut biome tests and stuff to help you better understand what's in there and how to uh, manage that a little bit better and, and treat it a little bit more accurately. Here's another situation that I think we can all definitely resonate with is a sterile modern lifestyle. Are we living a little too clean? And now go back 500 years and modern medicine didn't, wasn't that helpful in terms of anything better than like wash your hands regularly to stay clean and healthy. Now we have a lot more advanced in that, but maybe we've gone a little too far overboard where you're constantly Purell and sterilizing and have hand wipes and anti back antibacterial stuff and everything's getting wiped down a thousand times and you're not just living you're not like playing in the dirt so um if if you're spending a lot of time indoors and in, in like with office work modern living remote work remote living and stuff um you're trying not to get dirty you take showers twice a day maybe we're overdoing it and we're not allowing our bodies to thrive in the natural process of what it is. Certainly we should be practicing good cleanliness, washing your hands regularly, covering your mouth when you cough, you know, take showers and baths and, and all that stuff. That's, and that's all good, but we may not need to go overboard and excessively, uh, you know, do this. So lack of beneficial bacteria in the food supply. So everything being ultra clean, and good manufacturing practices are, are great to help reduce potential for infection or disease or illness or anything in our food supply, but also um, that you might be ridding the good bacteria as we go. Uh, the abundance of beneficial bacteria found in the dirt and soil. If you're just not playing around out in the dirt, I was out in doing some landscaping this weekend because it was super nice out and I had some bags of mulch sitting around that needed to get distributed in the area. So I was digging in the dirt and was kind of getting back to you know, my roots and, and uh, playing around out in the back. Um, bacteria is reduced in thoroughly washed and highly processed foods. And then dishwashers help clean things too. Now again, we want to be clean just do we need to have like carry Purell around with us for and use it literally every time you touch something? Maybe not. All right, so uh, food in the microbiome. All right, so 
dietary changes can alter your gut health in as little as 24 hours. The, it, absor it impacts the absorption and the production of your m microbiome, the, the digestive enzymes, the, the bile, the, all the different types of uh, you know, things that are going on in the digestion itself. So a unhealthy diet consequences. Ultimately, from eating poor diet, lack of balance, maybe eating some of these three guys here, processed meats, processed flours, uh, cooked fried foods. These things are kind of void of a lot of nutritional density, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, and just are a lot of cheap calories in a sense. And your body can decrease absorption and, and decrease the production of some good healthy gut bacteria. So we get into some common digestion issues. So with this, we have stomach pain and beyond. So here's a number of ones that can really kind of cause uh, issues and you might resonate with. Uh, constipation, things going, plumbing a little too slow. So 15% of the U.S. population can experience chronic constipation. And I would say that's going more than three days without, you know, exiting. And it, it does back things up and it causes an alteration in your microbiome. Generally, there's a lack of fiber, a lack of water in the diet that isn't pushing things through so your stool firms up and slows down and isn't moving through the process of digestion. Lifestyle factors, uh, physical activity, stress, uh, even the, the squatty potty might be able to help with move things through the process. If you've seen that, uh, I think it was like three or four years ago, maybe five, the squatty potty came out and uh, it was all the rage and you'd see it even at Target or something being advertised <clears throat> so um, but if you're not moving a lot then your body doesn't have a reason to or an extra reason to move things through the digestion uh, if I have clients that are having digestive issues I always encourage walk for 10 minutes after you get done eating it can help get the body processing moving all the muscle contraction squeezing that you're doing are pushing things through the process and stress, excessive stress, like some of you may have felt. I know a lot of clients that I've worked with have felt the stress squeeze on them the last couple of years, what, 24 months, with a, a very, you say, about face style of living where a lot of just movement was limited and interactions were limited and life was limited. IBS is probably going to be one of the more things. Constipation does kind of fall into that diarrhea uh so we have bloating gas cramping abdominal pain this happens usually in the large intestines where things get trapped or get slowed down and the body can't clear it out or it's just causing so it does change when in the frequency of the bowel movements and even the appearance whether it's firm or soft or liquid or uh, all sorts of other colors and such that could change your your bowel movement so ibs is a chronic condition that you will have to manage long term through practicing good health good balance moderation principles like drinking plenty of water eating fruits and vegetables high in micronutrient capacity is going to help avoiding fried foods cheap foods processed foods is going to help significantly lower the situation around IBS and how often. <clears throat> Some of the triggers, so like we said, bread, cereals are those refined grains that don't and don't have and lack a lot of fiber. Processed foods, chips and cookies. If you have an office that is got a break room that's constantly filled up with sweets, treats and things like this, then you really need to go out of your way to avoid it because it's all too easy to walk by and grab a donut, a cookie, some chips, because they are just delicious. There's no way other to put it. They are enjoyable uh, to your mouth, to your senses, to your brain, and but not to the gut, right? Oftentimes, if you overeat cookies or sweets, you will get an upset stomach. Excessive amounts of caffeine, 
uh, coffee, carbonated drinks, alcohol could cause digestion issues, bloating, um, just upset stomach. Um, carbonation can cause some excess gas because of naturally the carbonation in itself. Uh, then high protein diets. Now this is an excessive amount of protein. Um, I've not had issues where people have been eating enough protein with a pairing of a sensible balanced diet around getting fruits, vegetables, and stretchy carbs in to be an issue. But if you're just just going overboard, protein, 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 then you know you could you've heard some maybe some bodybuilding gym rumors of it just being kind of bad, really bad. And, and we wouldn't want protein farts coming because it's uh, protein powder farts is what usually they happen. They just eat so much, like an obscure amount, like 300 grams of protein in a day, which is obnoxious. And most of you wouldn't even come close to that. Uh, dairy products, uh, cheese can cause some issues, uh, higher fat content in those, and then fried fatty foods can cause. So if we look at this, excessive amounts of protein, simple processed carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, high fatty type foods can cause issues. Stress and anxiety triggers for IBS. We have work, we have your commute. Uh, you know, Sarah lives in New York City and just commuting to work, is kind of an ordeal, especially if it was across town. If she lived uptown or downtown and she had to go vice versa and it was like a 45 minute, I had to hop on this train to get to that subway to walk a couple blocks to finally get there and it's pouring down rain or it's snowing and sleeting on you. You know, that's a lot of stress in itself. Problems at home, money problems, and not feeling in control all can impact your body in a negative way and then ultimately leads you to make not the best choices, whether it comes into the form of poor food choices, lack of exercise because you're just mentally exhausted and fatigued, or um, you know Netflix and chill. I'm going to hide from my stress, hide from my anxiety, and binge watch these episodes because I can get some level enjoyment out of it and not have to worry about the depressing money problems or whatever situations or stress that may be in your life or deadlines at work or whatever, then, you know, that can cause poor sleep patterns and you're not getting enough sleep, which then you really rely on more caffeine and maybe the donut instead of Dunkin' Donuts in the morning instead of, you know, getting the egg white wrap would be a more sensible play if you were to have a, uh, a food there. And you can see how the, the IBS cycle could persist by making not good choices. All right, so here's some other ones that kind of come up in and are often associated with digestion. So GERD, which is acid reflux, and you definitely need medications. But again, a lot of it can be controlled through diet, finding your triggers, uh, trigger foods that cause reaction, and then being able to get away from them and really practice, again, balance and, and avoiding those trigger foods. Celiac disease is severe gluten sensitivity. I've had celiacs where if they even cross contaminate the ladle or the knife or the serving spatula that they had, you know, moments before flipped like a burger or um, like a bun or a bread, a ch grilled cheese on the, the fry, and then it touched their food that has caused and triggered some pretty severe issues. I've heard my celiac clients talk about how they feel like they've poisoned themselves when a gl the gluten issue is there. We have Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. So there's just a lot of not good things happening down in the gut when Crohn's is. You do have to avoid and limit foods. Uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, sores and ulcers are developed in the coal lining. So more pain, more distress in the GI tract. And then diverticulitis, which are the, the small pouches in your uh, digestion uh, can, um, it, food collects in these, these small pouches and just sits there and decomposes and, and, and it just causes some really uh, severe pain where you might even have to go to the, the hospital to get some stuff. So 
less talk. I'd love to see in the, the thoughts. I've had some good stuff happening in the beginning. Would love to see some engagement now. Do you know what any, do you have any food triggers? Are there certain foods out there that trigger you that you know that you're aware of and probably should avoid? I would love to see in the chat box that. And then how does stress impact your gut health? You know, do, do you get stressed out and you see a direct correlation with upset stomach or lack of eating or digestion doesn't happen quite properly or things like that? I'd love to see it in the chat box. We'll take a, a moment here. And uh, as soon as we get one, then we usually can get quite a bit more to start doing. So who wants to be anything from Chipotle? And you can direct message me too, so none of your coworkers can see, which is perfectly fine. And I'm not going to announce anyone's name either. So that uh, now with Chipotle, um, I'm curious on that. But like their their slogan and motto and approach is local food fresh, and that they are trying to you know, create a really healthy environment. It could just be some of the processes of which they cook or the additives to the food that does get going through the process of, of cooking and preparing or the seasoning could cause some digestion issues as well. Uh, we have another one, fried foods, spicy foods, and wine crying emoji face. Yes, uh, I, I can understand how... You know, maybe drinking one of your favorite adult beverages and getting a, a, a not so good digestion can cause an issue. Now, one of the things I could imagine with this is portion. Uh, you know, one glass can easily turn into two or three. And then it can also, also, also be some of the foods that might be incorporated with wine. So think of that. Like that could be a possible trigger, the combination of the two might cause like a charcuterie board where you're having fatty meat, cheese, which we already dictated could be an issue with lactose and just the process of it being a higher fat food. And then the wine, that combination could be a trigger in your stomach. Uh, fried foods, we all love fried foods. They just taste really good. Who, who can go for a really nice, uh, well done fried french fries? just delicious we have some garlic and onions those are definitely some known triggers in gut health uh, so if you look at a low FODMAP uh, that's low uh, FODMAP F-O-D-M-A-P those are different types of food we're going to get into foods and stuff to look at eating and stuff here in a little bit but uh, the, it, it kind of points out some of the triggers that can cause gut health disruptions and the type of food that garlic and onions are are listed there and it would be things that you'd want to avoid that can cause issues and irritation in your gi milkshakes we're going to go with the um milkshakes are going to be the, the dairy in them or the sugar content or the high calorie amount that goes in there tomato sauce the acidity might be an issue. So thank you for these. I appreciate the engagement. Uh, and, and again, think about the portion, the combination of the food that may cause issues. We're going to start marching forward so I don't run out of time. we got about 15 minutes left and I like to talk. So, <clears throat> so how to improve your health. Uh, always a good reminder. Always consult your doctor first on these things so that you have an up-close um, connection with them and, and it's acknowledged but I will tell you that through my experience practicing a better healthier active lifestyle through balance moderation and, and having some flexibility can do wonders for you as well so here are eight steps to improve your gut health all right so how do we actually improve this uh, that we talked about some of the issues the disruptions that are caused and all so one get a proper diagnosis okay let's not go google it and go down that road like we've all done it we get on webmd and next thing you know you've got you know cancer or something and it's really just like uh, you have an infection uh, some antibiotics can help but then we'd also want to pair that with some probiotics and some healthy good fermentable foods so that we don't throw off gut biome as we've talked about so it's important you certainly can use the test kits and practice elimination diet, so removing foods 
for a say a one to two week time of frame and then slowly adding them back in that's what an elimination diet is and it can work tremendously if i have someone that has some pretty good severe gut health that's the first place we're going i've even had a lady she came to me she was in indianapolis she had pain like stabbing knife pain in her stomach within two weeks we had isolated and gotten rid of it and by the time five six weeks later she had a plethora of food options and, and availability she had an understanding of how much food she could eat what's the time frame in which she should be eating these types of foods so that she never got say overly hungry hangry and then over eight you know we don't want to do that stuff and then um so then we want to make sure that you're getting the right type of tests to uh, rule out some of those conditions that we talked about, those digestion issues. Uh, optimizing meal timing. So if you look at this plate, this is a really good plate. That's why I put it up there. A quarter of your plate is a protein. A quarter of it is, is your um, starchy carb, the potato. And then over half of it, piles of it are vegetables. You can eat a lot of vegetables at significantly reduced calories that fill you up and keep you from overeating high amounts of calories or high fried foods or fatty meats or any of that stuff. So again, it's talking about going into uh, practicing good uh, gut health as we go. Uh, we have another uh, question, does uh, gut health change as you age? Yes, we talked about that earlier in altering mac gut microbiome. Our bodies change quite a bit. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I always talk about, like, say, good old Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Austrian oak. You know, when he was in his prime, you know, physique days, he was a mammoth. That's why I called him the Austrian oak. He's just huge, giant, muscular guy. When he's 90, he's not going to look like that so he will be uh significantly less if we look at like any 80 90 year old or 100 year old look at the way their bodies look they feel how their what their interactions are what they even think about or how motivated they are for certain things so naturally as we go over time your body can break down your food choices can change your activity level changes your priority to taking care of yourself may change. Your responsibilities in life change, right? Now, I'm married. My Tomorrow is my 16-year anniversary. We have four kids, 12 to 6, three boys and a girl. And that's the relationships in our house are changing on a swear an everyday basis. <laughs> and so it's giving my wife and I a, a pretty good run for our money here. Now, so that is something to note that like all those lifestyle factors can impact gut microbiome and especially over age. If you've been always getting French fries and French fries and French fries, you've spent 20 years maybe not eating as many fruits and vegetables as you could have and the micronutrient vitamins and mineral type foods to, to, to make impact. Um, I've noticed recently some foods that would now give me heartburn but never did before. So that, that could be it. Um, uh, a change in the gut biome, maybe not taking care of or paying attention to your food. Um, body weight and overall health can impact that stuff too. If you're overweight and been overweight for a long time, that is a sign that you should move and change some of your digestion approach and all. So let's keep going into meal timing. Uh, we want a regular eating schedule. Here's a really easy one. Eat enough food to get you to the next time you're going to eat again. And that allows that you are not overeating at any one time of the day and you've thought about when is the next opportunity that I'm going to eat. Sometimes you can eat breakfast and lunch. Other times you're meetings, 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 work, work, meeting, meeting. And then it's two o'clock and you haven't eaten. So that, that, that breakfast should be a larger meal to get you to 2 p.m. if it were to dictate that. And what will happen is that then you won't go into two o'clock hangry and making a bad choice and overeating, which then just leads you into the, you know, the, a rabbit hole of just not good food choices and, and bad choices, which us humans do naturally. We just like, well, I had one Hershey kiss. I might as well like go to McDonald's and get a supersized Big Mac meal with biggest everything 
and and let's top it with an apple pie and now, now i just ate 2000 calories at dinner which wouldn't be necessary because you ate a 25 calorie hershey kiss so and one other thing here with this is the the migrating motor complex pattern it's a electromechanical activity about every 90 minutes your body is doing a muscular contraction to help flush through residual food so grazing and just constantly putting food in, food in, food in, and especially large amounts eliminates your body to clear out foods, which can cause bloating. So general approach is every three to four hours, maybe five. After that, you're going to be hungry and it may lead to bad decisions. So it keeps your metabolism and energy levels up. It keeps blood sugar levels stabilized. Uh, where You're going to get enough nutrients throughout your day, not at like dinner. Uh, prevent you from being overly hungry. So number three, we got to pick up speed as I'm running out of time. Getting enough fiber. It keeps you full longer. Carbohydrates have fiber in them. There's insoluble and soluble forms. And with that, we want to do it. It fills you up, slows down digestion, stabilizes blood sugar levels, prebiotic, prebiotics and probiotics. So prebiotics are fibrous foods that help create a diverse ecosystem. I have a, uh, a thing on that next. Um, and, and then also fiber acts as a gel to bind food residue together. So when your body does the, the electrical wave of contractions to sweep through, all that stuff gets pushed out and nothing's left over and you're not trapping anything in there or leaving it behind, causing some unpleasant after effects. So, uh, it, and it traps cholesterol too to push it out. So then you are lowering your levels. So what are we looking for? We want vitamin, uh, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, seeds. And then this really helps us when we have higher fiber diet, then we're reducing risks of obesity, heart disease, and cancer, which can cause even more problems than just having an upset stomach. Now, fermentable foods such uh, that, that feed your gut health, these are more probiotics, and we'll talk about those in a bit. Uh, onions, oats, nuts, seeds are examples. Uh, unripened uh, bananas, oats, beans, cooked and cooled starches are more resistant starch, which are good for you. Most plant foods contain a combination of insoluble and soluble fiber. So having a wide variety of food is really good and encouraging. Insoluble uh, whole grains, nuts, fruits, uh, vegetables. Think of things like um, uh, celery, the, the strings in the celery. That's like an insoluble fiber where it just binds things together. Number four, of course, we want to get into a stress management routine. And your, your uh, the enteric nervous system is your GI's own kind of nervous system and how it talks to the brain. So this is that gut is the second brain of your body. It's interacting with all these food, these chemicals, these bacteria, like there's trillions of things happening in your gut at any one day. Now we do know that stress is directly linked to GI distress. And so things like journaling, meditation, uh, having a counselor, a mental health therapist, specialist could really help here. And always engaging in mindful eating really helps set a relaxing time setting and an enjoyable process here. Now, uh, from there, we've got deep breathing is a really simple one. So let's try this now. We're going to do five of them. I know we're starting to run out of time here because I talk too much. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to do three of them. I want you to do this with me. So breathe in. Breathe in through your nose, hold it, one, two, three, and exhale. As you exhale out your mouth, let the energy just kind of sink into your body and, and relax. And then we're going to do again, breathing in, one, two, three, breathing in, holding it. The holding just pauses and allows you to center your mind, your focus, your body there. And then we exhale, exhale, exhale. And then one more time. Breathing in through your nose, filling your body with just good positive energy, oxygen, feeling alive, more energy, and then exhale through your mouth one more time. Hopefully, 
that helps. Number five is incorporating a wide variety of food. We want lots of different colors and uh, protein sources and vegetables and, and all these things help create a thriving ecosystem in your body. And we don't want to get too rhythmic in the eating the same things. Now, when it comes to food, here's some of the things that you just want to be conscious of. Artificial sweeteners may cause alterations in your microbiome and can cause uh, intolerances and, and such. So you do need to use moderation when consuming these. And then avoiding certain pesticides that have high pesticide residues. And that's what we have here. The Dirty Dozen, these ones are heavily used with pesticides, so you do want to be conscious. Definitely, definitely wash these before you eat them to try and get any of this residue off. And then the Clean 15, these are ones that are going to just be ad adherently healthier for you to eat, consume on a more regular basis and not have to worry about some of our uh, farming processes causing you bodily issues. Number six, incorporating probiotics into your diet. And so with this, probiotics like the actual supplement may help increase the number of good gut bacteria. Having probiotic type foods, aged cheese, kefir, sour cream, pickles, uh, yogurts, these are fermentable foods in your gut health and do cause positive changes in your gut health. Uh, prebiotics are food like onions, garlic, bananas, leeks, um, yeah, asparagus, certain prebiotic type components can definitely, these combinations of having these foods can help improve the strains of gut health bacteria and keep you moving forward. When choosing a probiotic, uh, you know, here's uh, the one out of 14 probiotic supplements contained exactly what was listed on the label. So you just need to be conscious and certain and do your due diligence and research. So you want to buy from a reliable source, be aware of the expiration, understand how much of the, the CFUs, the colony forming units are in it. Like they say on the label, 10 billion, you know, uh, probiotic uh, enzymes in here. And then having one that is refrigerated always helps. So here's a list of them that I found. You could take a screenshot of this or take a picture with your camera. Uh, on your phone if you want. I'll leave it up here for like 10 more seconds. <clears throat> These I found on healthline.com, which I have found to be a more trusted source of information. And I enjoy that for um, people to uh, go find accurate, more accurate, more scientific backed information. So there's that. And number seven, and then we have one more after this. Consume foods rich in poly. Uh, phenols. So it's a plant, com plant compound that has a lot of different health benefits that helps reduce blood pressure, inflammation, cholesterol levels. And if you don't have good gut digestion, you are not absorbing these things and it's passing through. So uh, again, if you want to take a picture of this, um, these are foods that you should be eating generally more of. And, and so we do want to enjoy that lots of different and then lastly increase water so i always love at least 60 or to 80 ounces of water and men for that's for women for men 80 to 100 or more drinking water helps bind things and move things through the waste process uh, your digestive tract um, i know that that i didn't realize that i didn't have something on fiber as far as uh, fiber content goes 14 grams per 1,000 calories is the standard amount. I personally always round up more. So I encourage women to get a minimum of at least 20 grams of fiber, 30, 40 grams in a day. Men to get a minimum of at least 30 grams of fiber because it promotes you picking higher quality, healthier, more micronutrient dense foods that are going to improve your gut health. All right, so... Uh, quick, we have just like two or three more slides left, and then we are done. So in the chat box, what are any of those steps that you think would help best, you know, work for you in improving your gut health? Is it having more water? Is it having more 
pre probiotic prebiotic foods is it um and we can go back over them uh, so incorporating prebiotics watching some of the different types of foods that you eat uh, incorporating lots of food into your body stress management getting enough fiber in your food optimizing your meal time and make sure you're getting properly diagnosed let's get you back to the end here all right so i do have a question popped up why men's daily need for fiber is almost three times that uh, women on average well i say 20 to 30 grams of fiber uh men 30 to 40 grams uh men get to eat more food than women they're generally larger and that would be a really good idea to and, and that's a simple uh, reason why their fiber needs are more you get to consume more you can take a picture of this we will conclude here um i only have like one more so here's some gut biome the american gut project or u biome to get you started to help with tests so you can take a picture of that then lastly this is the last slide your gut health is very important and, and is complex and it's worth keeping yourself in a healthy state of being lots of variety of your diet eat plant rich foods fermentable foods reducing your stress and limiting alcohol you can improve your gut health and hopefully reduce and eliminate you know, unwanted symptoms associated with poor gut health. So there we go. Thank, thank you, you so much, Brian. And thank you so much, everyone. Um, I know, you know, we're a little bit after, so if you have to run, run. I mean, we could stay around for maybe another five minutes if anyone wants to stick around and ask Brian questions. Yep. Um, However, and then yes, please go to Brian's website. He provides um, free initial consultations. So, um, and do you do things virtually and in person? Um, well, you know, I, I would say I haven't hired someone that's been in like a, even a gas tank's worth of drive around me. So I get people, the last phone call I had before was in California. And then the next one I'm gonna be talking with is in Boston. So you get people everywhere. Great. And I, and I am capable of handling a wide variety of things. Uh, if you visit my website, it'll kind of go through a video of what my general approach is with clients. Uh, it'll talk about who I'm looking for and how I help. And it'll talk about my momentum program around creating a better, healthier, active lifestyle for you to be able to, uh, you know, live a lifestyle that gives you the look, the feel, the body, the energy that you want to live in and be excited about and not be weighed down with digestion issues, uh, fatigue, uh, just unwanted body weight. So good Thank belly. You so much. Uh, we got a video. So, yeah. We got a question about good belly probiotics. Uh, however, you need to switch up your probiotics every once in a while. Is that true? Um, one, I would always, always, always do an extensive research on reviews and scientific studies like National Institute of Health, NIH.com, and look at studies on that, not necessarily any company's marketing that is gonna tell you that whatever thing it is, is the best thing ever. Um, so by uh, if we need to switch up your probiotics every once in a while, if you go back to uh, kind of the periodic uh, underlying theme of having a balanced, moderation and flexible diet, uh, having a lot of variety in your foods, having a lot of pre and probiotic type food choices, and having lots of diverse colors in your diet is going to naturally switch up the impact of gut biome uh, inside the healthy bacteria. So, so uh, we don't need to, you, you're not going to have like your gut biome tested and know exactly what's in there right there's trillions of, of bacteria in there and they're all engaging and interacting uh, independently or in conclusion with each other but you know if you're doing the uh, best job on the front end having a probiotic drinking water getting enough fiber having lots of colors having enough protein eating enough food to get you to the next time you're going to eat again you're your probiotic situation, your health, your gut health, 
you probably won't have any gut digestion issues in the first place because you're just doing good food practices and managing your stress as well. So that's how I'd answer that. A little bit longer <laughs> answer for that. Other questions? Any coming through? This is your chance. <laughs> yep, you ask it. me anything. So fair inspiration, need to get back to my Whole30 diet. Now Whole30 is a way to go about practicing a general approach of avoiding some of those three, those big three, like I said, uh, gluten, lactose, and soy. Now, my opinion is if you don't have issues with gluten, lactose, or soy, why are you trying to go out of your way to avoid them? They aren't inherently bad for you. What's bad is like if you don't have gluten issues and you take out gluten for a year, when you put it back in, it may cause issues. And that piece of pizza that you've been avoiding forever finally wears you down and it's a last second call and things are whatever life has for you, you end up eating it, then you are going to have gut issues. That's not a good idea. It's practicing balance, having enough gluten or dairy or soy and not overly excessively having any one of them. Now, the whole 30 is going to give you a wide variety of good plant-based, lots of vegetables. So that would be a good place to model type of food choice and approach. But I don't think you have to exclusively follow the Whole30 unless you have extensive um, digestion issues. So that, that's kind of my uh, kind of take on any one diet, whether it be Whole30 or Mediterranean or whatever else. It's like, let's look at brass tacks of what you're doing every day. And does it even make sense of what you're doing? Like, again, avoiding gluten because you think and heard on the internet is what you need to do. I don't believe that's the case. You can't eat a piece of bread and still enjoy good gut digestion and good balance in your, your life as well. Uh, we have something about milk versus milk substitutes like almond. Brass tacks mean that kind of wearing the nutrition hat mainly. I'm looking at calories, caloric impact, and what's in those to that impact your overall health. So switching to an almond milk will obviously get lactose out of your system uh, because you're not taking in dairy. Uh, dairy in general is a simple carbohydrate, meaning it has sugar attached to it. So skim milk is about 90 calories a cup. Whole milk is 150 calories a cup. The biggest difference is fat. There's a lot of fat in the whole milk. There's not a lot of fat in the skim milk, none. And that's why you see the caloric discrepancy there. Almond milk, unsweetened, ideally, not the sweetened kind, but almond milk, one cup is only 30 calories. So you can have like three cups of almond milk for the same amount of calories as one cup of skim milk. So for me, at fast first glance, if you don't have a lactose issue, I'm just looking at this as being a, a calorie situation. So is it a good idea to use the bullet mixer to have veggies in liquid form or would it remove the fiber? Well, if you are juicing, you are squeezing the juice out of the vegetable and fruit produce, thereby eliminating your fiber. Um, and then... But if you're blending it and drinking it, you're still getting all the fiber. Whatever's on the nutrition label is going into the body for the portion size that you use. So, um, so definitely. Now, and then last question, last question, because it's by the same person. And then I'll be done, Sarah, promise. Do you think that using protein shakes uh, uh, is a midday snack? Yes, definitely. Protein shakes are an easy way to get protein into your day and boost it and make it enjoyable. Uh, we use it around workouts or in times of convenience. If you have back to back to back to back to back meetings, having a protein shake and an apple or some baby carrots could be a simple one minute meal that holds you over and avoids this. And so that would be it. So uh, there you go. Thank you so much. No, we really appreciate you staying to, to answer these questions. We really appreciate yep. it. I talked too um, much earlier in the presentation, so that might have Oh, no, it's helped. great. Great. So. Um, no, we just 
uh, um, although I'm going to stop the recording. Recording stopped. We have to use, we're, we're now, you know, hopping to another meeting. So, um, but I really appreciate you being here. Yes. And um, thank you everyone for these amazing yep. questions. You, you. you know, it really, it, it just makes it all so much more informative yes. and interactive. Yeah. So hope you got a lot you. out of it and looking yes. forward to it. So we'll be sending out Brian's information.